All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And in this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion of our various ICU drips. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about our inotropes. Now, this should be a pretty quick lesson, so make sure and keep watching as we learn about this pretty awesome class of medications. But if this is your first time to our channel and watching one of our videos, then we do invite you to subscribe to our channel below. Make sure you guys hit that bell notification icon, that way you'll be notified as soon as the new lessons become available to you guys. As always, I truly value the subscriptions, the likes, and the comments that you guys leave for us, and it really goes a long way to help support our channel, and for that, I do want to thank you guys. Alright, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. Alright, so let's go ahead and continue this lesson as we begin to talk about inotropes. And so let's really start off and begin this discussion and talking about what really are inotropes. And so to start this off, really these are a class of medications that work to improve our cardiac contractility and thus our cardiac output. So in order to, to really understand this, we want to have a good understanding of what this means and how this works to improve our cardiac output. And I'm actually going to link to a lesson up above that I had done previously covering cardiac output. But essentially our contractility is the ability of the heart to contract and then the subsequent force of that contraction. So just as a quick review, let's think back to our cardiac output calculation. We know we have cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And then within our stroke volume, we know that this is composed of three things. Our preload, afterload, and contractility. And so essentially, if we increase our contractility, we're going to increase our stroke volume and therefore increase our cardiac output. And so these class of medications are going to be specifically working to increase that contractility, like I said, with the end goal of raising our patient's cardiac output. And so really we're going to be using these medications in low cardiac output states, and most notably of these is going to be our patients with heart failure. And so again, I'm going to link up above to the playlist on heart failure that we had done not too long ago that really kind of talks about this. So we know what these medications are supposed to be doing, but the real question is how do they achieve this effect as well as what are the medications that are a part of this class? And so when we talk about how these medications are having this effect, there's really two primary ways in which they do this. One is by either impacting our sympathetic receptors, or the other is by inhibiting an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. So we're gonna talk about each of these here and we're going to start off in talking about a group of medications that we like to call our catecholamines. So now these drugs work by having an effect on adrenergic receptors. And essentially all of the medications are going to have an effect on our beta receptors, so our beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. And again, if you remember, the primary effects of the beta-1 receptors are going to be in the heart, and the primary effects of the beta-2 receptors are going to be in the lungs and blood vessels. But in addition to this, uh, depending on sometimes the dose of the medication that we're giving, some of these uh, medications are also going to have an effect on our alpha receptors. Now the primary receptor that we're going to focus on is going to be our beta-1 receptor. And in the heart, what we're going to see is an, an effect of an increased heart rate and ultimately and increase contractility. Now there are a whole host of different catecholamines uh, that are primarily used for other things and we did talk about a lot of those within our lesson that I'm going to link to up above on vasopressors. But at the same time it's important to know that these medications do have an impact on contractility and while they can be used to achieve some other desired effect you can also get this increased inotropy with it. So the first of these medications, which is one that we covered in that lesson on vasopressors, is going to be a medication we call epinephrine. And while this medication is primarily used as a vasopressor, of the vasopressors, this one has the strongest effect on contractility. So when we talked about it in that vasopressor lesson, we talked about that it really is a non-selective adrenergic agonist, which means it has an effect on all of the adrenergic receptors. Although, when we do have it at lower doses, it has more of an affinity for our beta-1 receptors. 
Now when we look at epi, we're usually going to find this mixed up in a concentration of 1 milligram and 250 mLs. And our standard effective dose is going to be 1 to 10 micrograms per minute. And epi has a quick onset of 1 to 2 minutes, and this is something that we usually will titrate every 5 to 10 minutes. So again, typically we're going to be using this for its vasopressor effect, uh, but oftentimes, especially with this medication, you may also be using it to see that increase in contractility and increase in your patient's cardiac output as well. Important to know that this one should be given through a central line. All right, so the next medication that we're going to talk about that, again, we also covered in the vasopressor lesson is going to be a medication called dopamine. So typically, this medication is going to be used either as a vasopressor or for its effects on the beta-1 receptor and most notably increasing heart rate in patients with bradycardia. Uh, but again, just like with epinephrine, we're also going to see this increased contractility. Now, dopamine is going to have a stronger effect on our beta receptors as opposed to our alpha receptors, and in particular in lower doses it's going to be much more selective for those beta receptors, but as the dose gets higher and higher, you are going to see an increased affinity for those alpha receptors. Now for dopamine, we're usually going to find this in a premixed bag of 400 milligrams and 250 mLs, and our effective dose for dopamine ranges anywhere from 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Although for our most inotropic effect, so essentially to be acting more as a beta agonist, that dose is going to be in the range of 5 to 10. Now this one has a relatively quick onset of 5 minutes, and it's something that we're usually going to titrate about every 10 minutes. And it is important to know that this one can be given either peripherally or centrally, but a central line is preferred. All right, so the next medication we're going to talk about is a medication called dibutamine, or you may see the trade name Dobutrex. And this is going to be the first of these medications that we're going to be used primarily for its inotropic effect. And part of the reason for this is dibutamine has its primary effect on our beta-1 receptors, although it does have limited increase in heart rate as a result of that activation. Dibutamine does also have a strong effect on our beta-2 receptors, which within our vasculature is going to cause vasodilation. So it's important to keep an eye out on your patients because you could see a drop in their blood pressure as a result of this. And it does have a small effect on alpha receptors, although it's not going to be anything significant that we're going to really notice. Now for dibutamine, we're going to find this usually in a premixed bag that comes in a concentration of 500 milligrams and 250 mLs. And do be careful with this medication too because sometimes people will get this confused with dopamine, especially if they don't have the, the premixed bag concentrations quite memorized, that they do sound similar. Now these are going to be two very different medications that also have two very similar rates of infusion, so it's really important that you pay attention to these. Now for dibutamine, our standard effective dose is going to be anywhere from 2.5 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And this has an onset anywhere from 1 to 10 minutes. And if we're going to be titrating it, you're going to titrate it every 5 to 10 minutes, although this isn't one that we typically are going to be titrating to a protocol and usually we'll adjust the rate based on what the provider is wanting, and if anything, titrating down. Now again, this one can be given either peripherally or centrally, but once again, a central line is preferred. Now the last medication that I'm going to talk about within this group of catecholamines is going to be a medication called isoproteranol, or you may also see the trade name isoprel. And this is a medication that really isn't used a lot anymore, but you still may definitely come across it, so it's good to know. And this one's going to have primary effects on our beta receptors, so our beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Now, unlike dibutamine, this one actually has a greater impact on heart rate, and so it's primarily going to be used for bradycardia, but it's important to know that it does have a strong inotropic effect. Unlike dibutamine, this has no alpha receptor activation. But, just like with dibutamine, this may also have that vasodilator effect from the beta-2 receptor activation. So again, it's going to be important to make sure you're keeping an eye out for hypotension. Now for this medication, we're usually going to find it in a concentration anywhere from 1 to 4 milligrams and 250 mLs. And our standard effective dose is going to be 2 to 20 micrograms per minute. And this one has an onset of 1 to 2 minutes pretty quick, and this one you usually will titrate about every 3 to 5 minutes. 
This medication can be given either peripherally or centrally. All right, so that's our group of catecholamines when we're looking at our inotropes. Uh, really, the vast majority of these aren't ones that you're going to be using primarily for that inotropic effect, but it is important to know that these medications are going to have this effect on our patient's contractility, and so I did want to mention them here so that you had an awareness of these medications. All right, so the other group of inotropic medications that I want to talk about is something that we call phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And so now these medications actually work by inhibiting the effects of an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. And there are, uh, there are a few different types of this enzyme, but at low doses, these medications are going to be selective for type 3, what we call PDE3. But as we get into higher doses, that they are going to be non-selective. And so just as a quick understanding of how this actually improves our patient's cardiac output, this enzyme phosphodiesterase works on cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or what we call CAMP. And so when we inhibit this enzyme, we actually end up with more CAMP available to the cells, which in turn leads to more calcium available to stimulate muscle contraction. And so by inhibiting this enzyme, we're going to be allowing more of this CAMP to be available to cardiac muscle cells, which is ultimately going to lead to a stronger force of contraction. Now, we are also going to see an effect within our blood vessels. And within smooth muscle cells, the inhibition of this phosphodiesterase is going to prevent the metabolism of something called cyclic guanosine monophosphate, or CGMP. And CGMP leads to vasodilation in both arteries and veins, and this is actually going to lead to a greater vasodilatory effect than what we see with those beta-2 agonists. And therefore, again, we could really see a drop in our patient's blood pressure as a result. Now, when we talk about the drugs in this class, there's really only two medications that we would come across. The first one is a medication called enamronone, but it's not something that you're probably going to see much, so we're really not going to talk about it here. The other medication that I do want to talk about, and it's something that you will probably come across quite a bit, is a medication called milrinone, or by the trade name, Primacor. So again, milrinone is going to have its primary effect on our PDE3 and work to inhibit the effects of phosphodiesterase. And this medication we're usually going to find in a concentration of 1 milligram per 10 milliliters. And so you're often going to see this medication in either 5 milligrams in 50 mLs, or 20 milligrams in 100 mLs, or 40 milligrams in 200 mLs. Now, our standard effective dose for this medication is going to be 0.25 to 1 microgram per kilogram per minute, but typically we're going to find our doses in the range of 0.375 to 0.75. This one has an onset anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, but it does have a long half-life, so when we're titrating this medication, which similarly to dibutamine, it's not one that we're typically going to be titrating, more so titrating down as we're coming off of the medication. But this one you would titrate every 15 to 30 minutes or sometimes even wait longer to ensure that the medication has worked its way out from the previous dose. And with milrinone, this medication can be given either peripherally or centrally. And so that's pretty much the only medication within this group of phosphodiesterase inhibitors that we're going to talk about. So a very unique medication, quite different than the catecholamines that we find. But all of these medications, either as their primary means or as a secondary effect of the way that they work, these medications are going to be classified as inotropes and really work to increase contractility in our patients ultimately leading to an increase in their cardiac output. All right, so that is going to sum up this lesson here for you guys. I uh, hope that you guys found this information useful, that hopefully this lesson gave you a little bit better understanding of what these medications are, as well as some of the differences between these different medications that we find within this class. And so with all that said, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you did find this lesson useful, please go down below, leave us a like, or subscribe to our channel, uh, as well as leave us a comment to let us know what you think or if you had any questions. 
Uh, like I said, we love to hear the feedback that you guys have for us, uh, and it really is supportive for our channel, and we appreciate that from you guys. Make sure and check out the other lessons that are a part of this series and talking about ICU drips, as well as take a look at the previous series of lessons that we did in which we talked about the endocrine system. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and you have a wonderful day.